We'll go ahead and dive into today's presentation. Again, my name is Jake Smith. Again, and we all sincerely appreciate being here today. Today's topic is going to be developing an effective standard of work for operations and service contracts. As with uh, any any of our discussions, our Ask the FM doctors, uh, we'll definitely watch the chat box. I see we have uh, Derek Hillestead here. He's uh, one of our other FM doctors, so be sure to uh, type in the chat box. Derek will watch that and uh, certainly respond and provide comments here. So today's agenda, uh, we'll do some quick introductions. We did that. We'll have a teaching moment. We'll have uh, peer groups, depending on what folks want to do. And then we'll have open office hours at the end of our discussion here today. A little about the Simplar Foundation is to basically promote best practices in the industry through engagement with academia in a variety of different settings. And uh, we're, again, we're happy to, to do this and uh, be here with all of you uh, today. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, some folks like to get uh, continuing education credits, so if that's you, be sure to go to Zoom and rename yourself. That way we can uh, make sure we track you and, and give you full credit where uh, that's needed, but uh, in-house. Make sure you update your name, and uh, that'd be fantastic. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive into our topic here today. And let me make one small change. And folks, if you can meet yourselves, that'd be fantastic. And uh, here we go. So our agenda, uh, we're going to talk about why the statement of work is so important. We'll talk about how it's uh, a balance between too prescriptive and overly prescriptive and also provide some uh, tips and specific recommendations on how we can actually better write Lisa's our company. statements of work. So I'll uh, keep that in mind as we go through and work on that. OK, so one thing to keep in mind with this is that as a vendor, there's always many fish in the sea as it were, right? There's always options and available opportunities out here. What we need to do, especially given today's market, is to make sure that we stand out to the industry. So if I'm a vendor looking to propose on a project, we want to be attractive, right? We have lots of projects here now, and it's, it's frankly quite a struggle to get people sometimes to be interested in our projects. Because if we look dangerous, obviously it's going to uh, encourage the vendors and suppliers not to propose our projects here. So at the end of the day, what we need to focus on is how do we attract more high performing vendors on our projects? That's the fundamental question and goal that we have here as we um, think about our our project as we, as we go forward with this, right? It starts with your solicitation. That's the key of all this is having a good solid RFP is going to make sure that this entire process is effective, that people actually enjoy it, and uh, they actually propose on our projects. Now, we think about a good quality RFP or request for proposals. There's really two main parts of this. Now, we're, gonna got, we're not going to go through each of these in detail here, but uh, the first part of this is focused on what are we actually buying as a client or as a customer? What are we buying? The second part of this is focused on how we're going to evaluate ensure that we're going to actually deliver something that uh, meets the intent of what we are buying here, right? So um, that's that's kind of how we're thinking about this as we go forward and as we uh, get this set up, right? There's lots of different terminology here in terms of RFPs, statement of work, ITBs, whatever you have here, it's all a different type of solicitation, right? Now, when you think about an RFP or specifically a statement of work, the goal of this is to paint the picture of what we want right now. <laughs> let's take a quick pause here. Does anybody like Bob Ross? Anybody watch that growing up, right? Or seen in the past? Amazing painter, right? Does really good work here. And it's amazing to watch his efforts to come to fruition in terms of when, when a painting happens, right? Well, our statement of work is the same idea, is that we want to deliver something that people um, can actually understand what's happening. And what this does more importantly is it convinces the vendors that we have a an idea of what we actually want, oh and therefore they're more likely to propose on our projects. That's what the goal is as we as we think about this. So we're going to go through and focus on the specific details of what a high performing statement of work looks like. And we'll also provide a checklist at the end if you have an interest or you want to download and use it for yourself. We can also provide that. But that's kind of the goal of today's uh, presentation. So five main parts to this here: uh, the, the overview and purpose the future work, which you're looking to get done, itemized requirements, the schedule and the budget, and then also um, any unique considerations you have about this particular project. So this we're gonna talk about, we're gonna provide a lot of specific detail here, and uh, we'll jump into this. The first thing to keep in mind as you go through this here is that you wanna keep it clear, concise, accurate, 
and complete as best you can. It may not always be possible to do that, but that's kind of our intent as we think about that, right? So the first part of this, the overview and purpose, what this should describe at a high level is what and why you're looking to do this project, right? That's the very first thing here. So what does this entail? What does this consist of? The first thing I would do is provide a high level summary that is easily understandable. Typically one to two sentences, maybe a paragraph or two, just very simple to understand what's actually going on here. I would avoid technical language, jargon, oh, yeah, details, like things nice. that uh, folks don't understand what's going on can make that um, a little bit easier here. Let me make one little change. Okay. So that's the, the intent of what this is going to provide for us, right? A high level of overview of the project. The second part of this is a focus on the goals, objectives, and motivation, or in other words, what is the business drivers for why you're doing this project, right? Why as a company, as an organization, are you looking to buy whatever it is, right? So some example of this, right? So let's say that you're buying a new roof. Is it to buy a new roof for the purposes of you know, having new waterproofing, or is it to actually keep water out of the building? Obviously, our goal here, the business driver, is that we have leaks in our facility, and we don't want that anymore. That's why we're doing this. If you are involved with catering or food services, is it to purely provide you know, food for the students, or is it to make sure that, uh, in the case of universities, or if you have a sales component, is that people keep coming back, buy more of that same food, right? What's the business driver for why we're actually doing this here, right? Okay. So, um, and folks, I just want to make sure, is everybody hearing me okay? If uh, you're not, please um, jump in here, but I think everything's okay. All right, awesome. Thanks, Corbin. Thanks, Derek. So third part of this is that to make sure you identify the key measures of success. What are the top three to five quantifiable metrics that you can look at and especially go to your boss and say, well, we bought this project, we bought this service, here's how well we know it's going, right? That's the key thing we're trying to focus on here. What metrics can you go through and think about? Now, what I have found uh, in my professional experience is that this is really difficult for people to do. We want to sign the contract. We're not ex exactly sure how to evaluate that performance. But my recommendation is I would have something typically tied to cost or schedule that you can point to say, well, here's the average change order rate. Here's the average customer satisfaction, whatever it might be, is you would definitely want to spend some time going through and providing what these metrics are, right? Now, uh, I want to do a small uh, comment um, about what I actually mean by putting your overview and purpose up front. I literally mean is on the first page of your RFE document, right? So you have the cover page maybe, but then like page two will be um, out of the Word file or whatever, the PDF, is here's our statement work. Here's our overview and purpose. Many times what I see is that a lot of organizations tend to provide a um, <laughs> almost like a history. You know, in 1885, our company, our city did this, and it goes through all this history, which is fine, but what I found is that most vendors aren't really interested in that, right? Get to the main reason as to why we're actually having this project, right? Get to the point, make it up front so people can actually find it. Okay, so that's overview and purpose. The second part of this is a focus on the future state. Or in other words, after this project or service is done, what do you hope that the future will look like in terms of your organization, right? The way you wanna do this here is describe the major deliverables and services to be provided by the vendor, and also describe what is it going to take for you as a buyer or as an FM to be 100% satisfied with this project or service, right? What's gonna to take to actually make this happen here? You can also attach exhibits and other high level things, or I should say details or specifications so that folks actually understand uh, what is going to happen here. In terms of this future state, here's how I would structure it. I would have your overview, so clear, concise, you know what's gonna happen in the future. You have your project deliverables. And what these are is a, a specific list of tangible outcomes that people know what's going to be provided as part of this project. So I would go through and in detail, make a checklist of all the things that they're going to do at the end or provide at the end of the service here. The third part of this is any figures, diagrams, references that might be beneficial to help explain, here's what we're looking to get done. 
right? I'm not saying load the entire thing down with lots of figures, but sometimes that can help make it a little bit easier to understand. And finally, if you are transitioning to one supplier to the next, or somehow there's some sort of my, you know, migration time, make sure you account for that as well and think about that. Again, folks, if you have questions or comments, be sure to use the chat box. Uh, myself and Derek are watching that, and I will certainly address your questions as we go through this. Okay, the third item here is any itemized requirements. And so I would go through and break down and provide examples, not example, but actual specifications as to what this is going to entail. Now, when you organize these itemized requirements here, I would try to use these in terms of major categories. So for example, if you're buying a janitorial contract, one of the things you might focus on is like, well, we have you know different buildings on our site. So you would go through and provide the details maybe for each one of these sites. Or maybe it's in terms of types of services, maybe it's floors, maybe it's windows, maybe it's you know, other treatments. Providing those different types of uh, classifications can make this easier. Now, one of the questions I see here from, uh, from Dean is uh, where would you include requirements such as relevant standards or regulatory compliance? That's a really good question, Dean, thank you. The way I would do that is by reference. So what I mean by that is that if you have a comment or something that you want something to get done, say, see this explanation at this website that provides more detail. What I wouldn't do is I would not insert that into the statement of work in the subform part. Again, the reason why is you want to make it easier for the vendors to go through and understand what actual requirements are. But if you have some sort of requirements that they have to meet that will include that maybe as an appendix or an exhibit that they can go through and refer through all the details as to what that would take place. Great question, Dean, thank you so much. So back to the itemized requirements, major categories, maybe use exhibits. The other thing I would do is I would not require a written commentary for every single requirement, right? So for example, what I've seen that sometimes on um, like IT buy, so if you have to buy a new CMMS system, I have seen in some RFPs where they have a list of all these detailed requirements and it requires the vendors to go through and provide a comment on every single item. From a vendor standpoint, that is extremely cumbersome. In fact, I had a project once where we did this and uh, the owner had approximately six to 700 requirements and the vendors had to go through and provide a comment on every single item. Now, I'm not saying that's not important for you to do, not at all. But what I am saying is that there has to be a time and a place to do that. And if you're just going through initially trying to solicit feedback or proposals from vendors, uh, that upfront part is probably not the best time uh, to do that, right? I would save that for later just to get a high level feel of what their plan is or proposal to deliver uh, the project. The other thing I would do too, and this is um, <laughs> this can be challenging, is to think about what are actually required versus what's actually desired. So you have things that are mandatory that you have to do this if we're going to assign a contract with this vendor. You have to do it. There's other things though that it would be nice if they did it, but they don't have to. Many times what I've seen is that we want to ask for everything under the sun and say, well, everything is mandatory, you have to do it all. But in reality is that not everything is actually like that. The reason why it's important to distinguish between mandatory and desired, because as a vendor, if I put everything as you have to do this, what's that going to do to my cost? It's gonna increase cost, right? So it's important to make sure that you think about and really give some really good forethought as to what do you actually need to do versus it'd be nice to have it, but if we can't do it, that's okay too. Right? Number four here is to provide details um, on the schedule and budget for the project. If you have certain deadlines when it has to be done, then I would identify that as part of your statement of work, right? So that's the schedule and also provide the budget. Now let's let, briefly, I wanna talk about the budget here, sharing the budget. And the question here for you all is, should we share the budget as part of our statement of work? Should that be in the RFP? How much money you have budgeted for this project? Shane says yes, he's been in a few classes, he knows the answer, right? The answer in us, in my opinion, in our, in our group's opinion, in size 400 font, <laughs> is yes. Absolutely provide your budget, without a doubt. Now, let's think about this here for a second. Sometimes when folks are nervous about providing the budget or, or normally don't do that, the reason being is that, well, if I provide the budget and the vendors know what my budget is, 
they're therefore going to inflate their bid prices because they know what my budget is, right? I mean, that's the most common reason why folks uh, don't want to do this here, right? So to stop screen share and have a, a brief conversation about this is that if I don't provide my budget, then the vendors have difficulty in understanding what they're actually going to do within the constraints of us as an organization. So let's say that you're concerned that the, the vendors are going to come in, they're going to artificially inflate the price of their bids, and therefore they're going to charge more when they actually could do it for less, right? That, that's our main concern. So if we think about that then, how many times have you seen a project where you actually have more money than you actually need, right? <laughs> Chances are it, it really doesn't happen that often. Typically what happens, we actually have less money in the first place, right? That's most commonly what happens. But let's just say for a minute that you actually have more money than you actually need in your project. You have a surplus in your budget, which is great, right? This whole thing breaks down that if you provide your budget and we're worried about the vendors inflating the prices, if one vendor, one vendor were to come in and offer a realistic price about what it takes to do the work, they're automatically more competitive. And so for that reason, then, all the other vendors are aware of that, and they also are motivated to provide a competitive pricing. Now, if you have a situation where there's collusion, and all sorts of other illegal things, that's a different discussion, right? But what I have found in all the thousands of procurements that we've been involved with here is that as providing that budget is really beneficial. The reason why is that if we're trying to hire expert vendors that really know what they're doing, having that budget number is one of the key pieces of information. They can't know whether or not your, your scope is feasible without that budget number. So we have a white paper. We can certainly talk about more about that. That's not you know, today's focus here, but I would definitely recommend to provide the actual budget number. Now, one of the questions here is, well, do we provide a budget range or a not to exceed value? My recommendation is I would provide whatever the actual budget number is. If you have a specific dollar threshold that you can't go over, then I would say that we cannot spend more than $500,000 in this project. I have seen projects before where the owner does provide a range and so it still leaves a certain level of ambiguity. And in fact, I've, I've kind of seen sometimes too, it can make things more difficult uh, for the vendors. So my recommendation is to provide the actual specific dollar amount for the project because as a vendor, they'll really appreciate that. So that's our recommendation, right? Now, when you think about um, the schedule and budget part of this, uh, some other comments, it's crucial, make sure you provide that. Um, I would provide whatever level of detail you have about your budget. So the construction budget, the construction budget for this project is $150,000. Estimated spend is you know, two million, whatever it might be. Provide the details of what that might be. Now, if you have more questions about that, we can certainly chat about that. But that is our our very clear and strong recommendation. And then finally, here wrapping things up is any unique considerations about your project. Now, what this means here is that if you have a project that you are buying or looking to hire somebody to do something on, there might be things about it that are not like a typical or normal type of project. In that case, I would recommend to have a special section that just calls out, hey, this project is different for these reasons. We're looking to buy this IT system, but you should know that we have some unique considerations about us as an organization, right? This could be lots of different things, right? So some examples we worked on in the past, uh, we had a is a concrete heavy project, but is also holding a cyclotron. And for those that don't know, a cyclotron is basically this big giant radioactive machine, lots of uh, radiation, so they had to do significantly more concrete. The specs were off the charts in terms of what they had to do. That's different from a normal type of project. We've had other projects too, where they're on remote locations, so it's really hard to get to. Again, calling these things out can just make it easier for your vendors to understand uh, what may happen. Uh, Dean, the site asbestos. Lead-based paint, if you see that on your projects, then I would definitely call that out. Sometimes we may not know about it, which is, is fine, but if you know for sure that you see, hey, we got asbestos in this location, I would definitely call that out. Because as a vendor, they can better prepare a strategy to deliver an effective project if they know what that is. You may not always know, which is fine, but again, that's, that's what our focus is here. Keep in mind here, um, our goal here is not perfection. We could spend all the time in the world and money in the world, right? Developing an amazing statement of work, but that's gonna cost a lot of money, right? We have to do the best we can within our resource, resource constraints. On the other hand though, 
we can't totally miss the target, right? If we're not spending some initial effort to go through and think about what's going to make us happy in the day, what's our financial picture look like? You know, what are the major tasks of this project? Doing these things as a vendor can help us get better pricing, better proposals, and can really optimize or make things more efficient in terms of our project. At the end of the day here, if our scope of work is too open-ended or maybe too prescriptive, this can also have an impact. So I want to close out today with a, a very short example of what happens if our scope of work you know, may not be accurate. In this particular example, this is a, a university's FM group. And part of what they had to do was to collect uh, recycling throughout the campus and then take it to the local recycling facility. And then that, that's basically what they had to do. They had to recycle. So 5,000 tons of waste across an urban area. As part of their scope of work, they specified that for the company that picks up these materials, the company has to provide an adequate fleet of collection vehicles should be used and maintained by the vendor. They also said is that it is the owner's expectation that the collection vehicles be designated for service a minimum of less than two years old at the start of the contract. So they told the vendors, the vehicles you use for our, our sites have to be less than two years old. Now, the reason why they're doing this is not nefarious or trying to be difficult, but because they wanted to make sure that they had the most efficient tools, efficient equipment on site, and they could better measure their sustainability goals. So they said, you have to use brand new trucks for our site. The other thing they said inside of the statement of work is that in order to measure, or excuse me, in order to support accurate measurements towards our sustainability goals, all vehicles have to be solely dedicated to us as a client and cannot be used for other sites. Now, the reason why, why they have this requirement is that they want to know how much stuff they're recycling and not have that mixed up with, you know, if they go by the, the city of Charlotte or whoever and also combine all these materials into one truck, right? Because then they'll have an accurate measurement. So they said you can't use it, right? So what's this, what is this going to result? In? Everybody think about this. Brand new vehicles and they can't be used for anybody else. What's going to happen to your average bid price? Everybody together, thumbs up, right? It's going to be much higher when we do that, right? So in fact, what we found in this project here is that the average proposal price was 50% over the budget. In fact, there was one proposal that was 106% over the budget, right? The reason why this is a concern here, and, and the lesson for you all to take away from this is that if you find yourself doing the, the means and methods of how to do something in your statement of work, that's probably too prescriptive. If you find yourself telling the vendors how to do their job, that's not what the goal is. What they should have done in this case here is, to, is say that we want to track our sustainability goals. We want to track how many tons of material that we're recycling every month. And so as part of your proposal for us, please identify how you're going to do that. We don't need to tell them, well, here's how you need to do it. You need to specify, hey, here's our goal. You provide us as the owner the best way to actually accomplish that. Does that kind of make sense? The means and methods versus what the goals are. Two different things and make sure we don't you know, tell the vendors how to actually do their job. So again, if our, if our scope is too prescriptive, it increases cost and make things more difficult, frustrating. And at the end of the day, this brings um, risk to the project. Now, has anybody ever used IFMA Engage? IFMA Engage. It is a fantastic resource that IFMA has put together where basically it's like an online discussion board. See, Derek's used it. I know several of you folks have used that before. It is a fantastic resource. If you have questions, you're trying to learn about things, IFMA Engage is by far um, a fantastic resource uh, for FM. So be sure to check it out. Derek, I don't know if you can, but if you can find the URL, drop that in the chat box and I give folks a chance to take a look at that. One thing I've seen though on IFMA Engage is that sometimes a very common question that people will ask here is, does anyone have an RFP for fill in the blank type of service? Does anybody have an RFP for a contract that it could see, right? That's the question that's commonly asked. What's intended by that question, I think, is, is when somebody says that, I'm not sure what task I need my vendor to do, do you have any recommendations, right? That's, that's kind of what we're looking for here. What is needed though, and kind of what our recommendation for a new perspective is, is to ask questions like this. What major challenges do my customers face and how do I find an expert vendor to help me solve them, right? So it's not so much about the specific details of the RFP or the statement of work, although that's important, 
It's really about thinking, why are people frustrated? In my site, what common things are people always talking about and how do I mitigate those issues, right? If we start changing our focus to more focus on what's giving problems at the end of the day, it's less effort the more to the right-hand side we think about this. It's more success and at the end of the day, it costs less if we have a different perspective about focusing on what are the main things that we need to, to think about. So in summary here, the key takeaways, uh, a couple major things, uh, a good statement of work will help you get better pricing in a more realistic schedule. It does not have to be perfect, folks. Please hear that it doesn't have to be perfect. But if we take some time and effort to go through the things about we talked about today, that will help it uh, get it better. A good statement of work has five major components to it. The overview and purpose, the future state, itemized requirements, the schedule and the budget, and finally, any unique, unique considerations. And then finally here is include your budget. Be sure to include your budget because at the end of the day, that will help the vendors understand what is the financial constraints that you face as an owner organization. Okay, so that's today's presentation. Um, we do have our virtual peer groups now and uh, based on the size of our attendees here, folks, uh, we can break out into small breakout rooms and just have a chance to chat and, and meet with each other. We can stay all here together. And uh, does anybody have a strong preference either way? Do we wanna do breakout rooms and chat with each other? Or do we wanna all stay here and have a, a kind of a conversation about this? Any preferences going once, twice? Yeah, that's Dean, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Let's all stay together, yeah. Okay, folks. So let's, let's kind of open up for questions here, right? Um, what have you done or what have you found um, in terms of statements of work that work well in terms of actually writing the thing out? Um, how do you engage your customers or view yourself? How do you work with procurement to get some of these thing, things done here? Um, it's kind of an open forum here, folks, to have a discussion and to chat about uh, what you have found uh, in terms of you know, what works well for you. So feel free to flip on your video, unmute yourself, and uh, Jump in here. Anybody have any thoughts? What works well for you in terms of compiling your statement of work? Dean, good to see you, man. Go ahead. How are you doing? Good. Well, one thing that I've always you know, recommended is to you know, start by just sort of listing out what your functional requirements are, you know, whether it's purchasing software uh, or you know, construction project is is you know, listing out what you want and sort of what are those criteria, you know, that's when you start getting into your mandatory and your optional kinds of things. And rather than just diving right in to start drafting the RFP is, um, you know, getting some internal agreement about what is it we want, you know, what do we need? And then you can actually start looking. Absolutely. I love that. Anybody else do that? Or do you have any other thoughts? Derek, how's it going? Hey, Jake. How you doing? Good. Good. Yeah, the, one of the um, kind of basic information pieces that I've always put in my RFPs and using facility condition assessments as an example would be to make sure that you're at least putting in the portfolio information. So you kind of alluded to this earlier, but, you know, total buildings uh, in the portfolio, ideally the total square footage of each one of those buildings. And, yeah. you know, and, and if you can, also the construction vintages of when the original construction was, when the additions were, uh, key renovations, you don't need to get into every asset and when your boilers were replaced, you know, that's what the condition assessment provider is going to do for you. But initially, just getting a good base knowledge down will help get a better uh, proposal, because if not, a lot of these condition assessment providers are going to just inflate their numbers due to the unknown. And so how do you narrow in the unknown a little bit and, and be a little bit more uh, informational so then the bidders then can sharpen the pencil and provide a better, uh, better proposal for the facility condition assessment itself? Absolutely. Great comments, Terry. Thank you. I have another thought. Yeah, when, go ahead. When you get into um, actually writing some of the uh, questions, uh, I've been in the unfortunate position in the past where I've had to evaluate responses to an RFP that I didn't oh, write. Oh, yes. Yep. 
And the questions, many of the questions were ambiguous. And so the, you know, the, the bidders were struggling to respond. And so you get this wide range. So really think about, you know, are you asking them a yes or no question? Frame it, you know, phrase your question that way. Uh, or if you're expecting them to provide some level of detail, be very specific about what the response needs to, uh, to include. But, uh, you know, have somebody else that, that kind of understands that review your questions so that they can maybe, you know, pick out, you know, those ambiguous ones. It's like, I didn't quite understand what you were asking for here. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe we yeah. should add a little more detail. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like that overview and, and purpose section of the statement of work. Like, if we take that paragraph or two to somebody that doesn't know anything about our project, and they know what we're trying to buy at a high level, that's, I would call that as a, a success, right? Making sure people understand what we're looking here is, is, I love it, Dean. Great comments, thank you. I think too that sometimes on the financial side of it, when we're evaluating the financial proposals for our vendors, if we don't actually know how we're gonna take the numbers that they give us and do something with that, that is a, a very difficult situation to be in. Because as procurement people, if they have this, this proposal, and we don't know how we're going to fairly evaluate these costs across you know, multiple proposers. It's very risky business here. So make sure we also understand we're going to evaluate the, the financial side of it too. Patrick, how's it going? New to FM, just got my FMP. Congratulations, Patrick. Very good. Still figuring stuff out. Applying for FM roles, absolutely. Uh, Dean, you might know, I think there's a, a job board too, right? With uh, F, uh, isn't there the FM yes. job? Um, yeah. so, sorry, yeah, guys. If you go to the, the can hear me. website um, and uh, poke around there, you, there is the, the job board. So yeah, there is a, a way to post your resume and, and also just looking for um, you know, jobs that are available. Yeah. Um, depending on where you live, if there is a local chapter of IFMA, uh, in many cases, the uh, local chapter will also have their own job board or openings for um, for things in the local area. So that's another good place to look. Awesome. Well, I, sorry, I appreciate that, guys. Uh, I'm actually in the Cayman Islands. Uh, so uh, awesome. I, I have actually applied for some roles. Thing is, my primary issue concern is, because I've been in the technical side of the world for a very long time, in refrigeration, air conditioning, and commercial kitchen equipment. So I'm transitioning now over to FM. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I haven't joined up with the local chapter as yet. Like I said, it's only a month now since I got my FMP. So I'm slowly transitioning, yeah. but eventually going to need some added support in terms of my, my thoughts, like I could be wrong. My wife thinks I'm wrong. I need <laughs> templates and I, I, so on. Because <laughs> like the SOW, uh, sure. the request for information, all of those things, I, I, I'm, I've been out of the actual office setting for a very long time also. Sure, sure. So going back into the, the, the office day-to-day -day yeah. grind is a little bit intimidating. I can imagine. Well, you know, we've got a whole yeah. folks, uh, we've got a lot of folks here that um, you know, work in this industry. I'd love to open up to everybody. Um, you know, what thoughts do you have about making that transition you know, into more a, a management role or any any thoughts or recommendations for Patrick or others that uh, might be on the call here? Anybody want to chime in here and offer your thoughts? Any solid advice? Well, there, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, facility management has been called the accidental profession because nobody actually started out to be a facility manager. We, yep. we do have people doing that now, but that was not always the case. Um, so, you know, I think it's really just looking for that opportunity to get, uh, get started. Um, if you have a good technical background, that's, that's a good start. And just being open to uh, an entry level job that will allow you to get into that and then uh, give you that opportunity to um, progress and advance, you know, in your career. So, 
um, you're you're a little bit you're you're kind of you're on an island. <laughs> Literally, yeah. So you know that that makes uh you know the job hunt a little bit more a little narrower. But you know uh, every building has a facility manager. So also be thinking yeah. about what types of industry you would like to work in. Um, so that's another one is. You know, do you want to work in a manufacturing setting or not? Um, so those are just some things to consider, and that might narrow your your search down a little bit. Um, I, my, my let, let me just answer that that Dean. My my search is actually pretty narrow right now. Like you said, I'm on an island, and it's not just an island; it's a very small island. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so there isn't a whole lot to choose from. I've kind of narrowed it down. I'd like to find something with the government. Uh, and so I've, I have applied for a few jobs already. I'm just, and jobs that I believe I can manage. Sure. It's just sure. that that transition in, in my estimation, because once I, once I get in, and I believe I eventually will, once I get in, it's going to be a little bit, well, for now, in my own head, it's a little bit intimidating with regards to getting started. I think yeah. once I'm up and running, I'm going to be okay. But I've been searching, for example, I found something on LinkedIn just yesterday that was, uh, I don't remember what it was talking about, but I downloaded the document as I'm looking for supporting documents, things, templates, um, how to do things practically, how to do it. I know uh, IFMA's knowledge. IFMA's knowledge library has a lot of really good resources, so be sure to check that out. The IF Engage, mm -hmm. like you mentioned earlier, is uh, an awesome resource. Looks like uh, Dean just posted a, a chapter map, so be sure to check that out. Uh, so there is a Cayman Islands chapter. Uh, so if yeah. you go to that, there is uh, some contact information in there. Um, I don't happen to know the the leaders there, um, but you know there there are. So you do have people there that can support you. So, all right. So, I, I I do intend to reach out to the local chapter, but like I said, it's just been a month, and sure. I've been wrapping up some other stuff. So I intend to reach out to the local chapter. I I think I know the the president or the leader there. John Santiago. Like you said, no, it's Ireland. Chip Chip. I thought it was Chip. Mm, so well, I'm, I'm just going based on what's on the website and shows what okay. the president is. Okay, no problem. No, I don't know John, but uh, but like I said, it's a very small island. Island, pretty much everybody knows everybody. Sure. So well, we're, we're a very uh, we're a very very social group. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> once you reach out, I'm sure that uh, that several people will be there to help you. Excellent. I'll I'll, I'll be sure to get that done. Awesome, Patrick. Well, good luck with that, and uh, keep up the education. And again, congratulations on the FMB. That's that's great. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so, any other questions or comments about statement of work or RFP development or procurement or anything about uh, today's topic? We'll also be posting the video here uh, once that gets processed. But um, any any other questions or comments? Um, you know, you were showing some of the examples which came from the Center for Procurement Excellence. It looks like um, yes. That appears to be also a membership organization. Um, are there any uh, resources or whatever that are available to share freely to the people on the call? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll be sending out a checklist that kind of goes through the statement of work um, evaluation. Um, so be sure to check that out. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'm going to drop my email here in the, um, in the chat box and I'll send that out to everybody. I'll send to everybody that signed up as well. I will send out a checklist, we'll have the slides. Also want to announce is that uh, next month, IFMA is publishing a new report about buying FM technology. And part of that will be focused on developing your statement of work. Again, it's focused on technology, but the overall idea behind developing our statement of work uh, will also be included as part of that IFMA resource. So. Yeah, you mentioned Engage earlier, and I monitor Engage on a regular basis, and quite often, um, I see questions like, can somebody recommend a X tool, you know, uh, a particular type of, of software product? 
And again, I don't think that's really the way where to start. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Because, you know, somebody's going to tell you, yes, I use XYZ tool and it does does great. They're probably in a completely different industry with a completely different set of requirements. Yeah. Uh, so it may not work as well in, in your scenario. So again, yeah. you um, one of the things that I know about FM and corporate real estate in general is that we have a relatively low technology skill and experience level. So we don't have many people in FM that have really had the opportunity to specify and procure software technology. So I think the first thing to acknowledge is that, yeah, maybe we have some limitations there and that you want to do a little more due diligence before just, you know, signing up to go look at demos. Now, like yep. I said, demos always work. Um, it just may not work when you install it in your implementation. So, yes. uh, you know, just be a little cautious of that. You know, they're, they're designed to wow the audience. So they're always going to show off the, yeah. you know, like I said, don't get enamored with the shiny new object. Um, the, the biggest challenge we have is bad data. And lots of places have bad data. So buying a new tool and putting bad data in it is not going to help you at all. It's, garbage in, garbage out, right? It's garbage out, and you now you're making business decisions based on bad data. Not a good scenario. Definitely not. Well, that kind of leads us um, to move on here a little bit. Uh, in fact, our next topic next month, uh, I mentioned the new resource that if my is uh, it's currently with graphic design, but we just wrapped that up, which is how do you buy FM technology more effectively. And uh, the things that are uh, being talked about will be a big part of that. So next month, uh, March 21st, buying the right FM technology solution for your organization. Be sure to check that out. And uh, that'll be our focus for, for next month. We also have the next 12 months of topics posted. Uh, April will be return to the office. Uh, May will be ESG, what every FM needs to know. June will be succession planning. So we've got lots of really great topics and uh, that's kind of the schedule here. With that, uh, that concludes our, our discussion today, at least the full part of our discussion. Again, thank you to IFMA for sponsoring Ask the FM Doctors. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. And with that said, we'll have open office hours. If anybody would just want to hang out and chat, ask questions, we're welcome to do that. But uh, otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.